Hi everyone, welcome to this event at Columbia University, um, hosted by the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise and the Office of, um, Student of Community and Government Affairs at Columbia University. So welcome to everyone who's joining us this evening. We are recording the event for later viewing. So my name is Sandra Navali. I'm the Managing Director of the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise, housed at the Business School, but relevant to all students and alumni and faculty across Columbia University and beyond. When we became the Tamer Center in 2015, our mission was broadened to be inclusive of social entrepreneurship and social enterprise, which means creating social and environmental value across the campus, but also beyond. And so this event um, is something that we're thrilled to be hosting this evening um, in partnership because it's so relevant to think about how Columbia University um, impacts its local community and can be a positive force for change. So it's my pleasure, um, my great pleasure to welcome Flores Forbes and introduce Flores to who will then moderate the session. Flores is the Associate um, Vice President for Community Affairs and also an adjunct faculty and an expert and author on topics such as urban development, economic community engagement, um, as well as um, criminal justice reform. And he's um, on a personal note, an incredible connector and has been a terrific friend to the Tamer Center as we've thought about our initiatives around community engagement, especially around community economic development, social entrepreneurship, and um, our own REAP program, our reentry acceleration program, which is trying to use the power of business to end the mass incarceration crisis. Um, so Flores, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much to all of you attending and our speakers, and in particular to Flores. Um, and you'll need to unmute yourself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Bundle Scholars Program, which is designed um, to offer independent community-based scholars from northern Manhattan access to a suite of Columbia University services and resources that allow the scholars to develop and implement a particular project. As in some cases, they have published books or created other projects related to to the Harlem experience, like the innovative presentations you will see this evening. The program is part of the university's community benefits and services related to our Manhattanville expansion. The first cohort was recruited and installed in 2013. It's a joint venture between uh, the Office of Government Community Affairs, the Office of the Provost, and the School of Professional Studies. This past June, the program was, re was renamed in honor of Columbia University trustee and program supporter, Alilia Bundles. The primary objective is to share the university's intellectual capital with our community so that we can help to harvest the great minds that inhabit Harlem and provide them with much needed platform to research and create the next big idea. Scholars will have access to our libraries, course auditing, and many other resources. We assist each scholar with connecting with these resources and offerings. Bundle scholars have three years to develop their projects. They are selected by university faculty, staff, alumni, and other alumni of the program. Over the period of their scholarship, they're given the opportunity to present, showcase their work via programs like this one being hosted by the Tamer Center this evening. So the uh, four scholars I'm going to introduce are uh, Karaoke Crosby, who will discuss his Harlem Maker Expo. Renee Cummings will discuss uh, artificial intelligence and the criminal justice, or better known as the new Jim Code. And Debbie Meyer, who her project explores uh, literacy, dyslexia, and the links to the criminal justice system. And Vivian William Carutz, We'll discuss growth and sustainability of the Harlem wellness ecosystem. So, uh, karaoke. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Loris, and, and um, thank you all for having me, um, giving me this opportunity to talk more about 
my project that is the Harlem Maker Fair, um, where it is and where I plan to take it. Um, so what I'm going to do right now um, is share a slide presentation that I created. And along with the slide presentation, I'll be talking a bit about the Harlem Maker Fair. So the Harlem Maker Fair is an, is an exhibit of creative coding projects, including but not limited to robotics, game design, web development, audio engineering, and as well, the visual arts. The projects are made by students, teachers, families, and hobbyists of various sorts. And to help participants, a Hall and Maker Fair curriculum is being developed that is focused on physical computing and creative coding. And it's uh, generated from the best practices that we discover at the workshops that we have leading up to the Hall and Maker Fair. The Holland Maker Fair is produced by a collective called Latimer Heights. Latimer Heights is a digital literacy uh, collective inspired by the life and work of Lewis H. Latimer, um, the black scientist who created the first practical light bulb, um, worked in uh, electrical engineering, air conditioning, and so forth. Uh, we're inspired by his work and um, <clears throat> we are a collective of educators who um, take some of his ideas and his influence and uh, we expand them using contemporary technology. Latimer Heights offers digital literacy workshops for children, youth and adults through partnerships with schools and institutions throughout the year. Latimer Heights teaches project-based coding and general computer science for the sake of problem solving and exploration of, of the digital world. Some of the areas that we focus on are app design, the internet, building protocols uh, via internet simulators, uh, the importance of computer languages, uh, talking about algorithms, conditionals, loops, functions, traversals, and things of that nature. Also cybersecurity, right? What can go wrong? <laughs> we talk about how to not get hacked and data, how to represent text, images, and sound digitally. So those are the main uh, areas that we cover. And um, we have some upcoming events. Our next Harlem Maker Fair is going to be a Zoom event, and it's going to be December 19, 2020, from 2 to 4 p.m. via Zoom. This is a program for youth, teachers, and families presented by Columbia University Bundles Community Scholar, Karaoke Crosby and Latimer Heights. At the Hall of Maker Fair this December uh, coming up, we're gonna be focusing on AI and machine learning, uh, drawing with JavaScript and representing data. We also have um, some upcoming programs mainly uh, app design for teens, transform your imagination. So in this class, teens can design an app that is a brochure of an extreme environment, such as uh, a vent on an ocean floor or even a parallel universe. We'll be using JavaScript for that, for that class. And to get more information about the classes, learn how you can register yourself or others for the classes. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that more in our conversation section, but to reach out to me, you can go to kc at latimerheights.org or kc3269 at columbia.edu. You can also go to latimerheights.org just to see what our classes are and um, read about our internships and our mentorships. And with that said, I'm going to pass it back to Flores. I don't know. Thank you, uh, Karaoke. Renee? Renee Cummings? Thank you, Flores. And that was a fantastic presentation, Karaoke. I very Thank much enjoyed it. Thank you so it. much.
Thank it's you. certainly an honor to be here and to be with you. And I, I say I'm, I'm proud to be a part of this program. I am a criminologist, a criminal psychologist, and I specialize also in therapeutic jurisprudence. And I've brought that entire fusion of criminal justice uh, practicing to artificial intelligence. And I've been looking at how uh, AI is being deployed in the criminal justice system. And my project is uh, creating a, a documentary and of course working on a book that looks at the deployment, that looks at the risks of how algorithms are deployed in our black and brown communities, actually black indigenous people of color and how those communities are impacted. I've been doing an extraordinary amount of work when it comes to uh, combining social justice and racial justice and design justice with algorithmic justice. And much of my work looks at data justice and how do we use data in a way that is equitable. So I find myself spending a lot of time working with organizations and uh, working with individuals when it comes to detecting risks and uh, managing those risks in uh, algorithmic decision-making systems. So I actually uh, got into AI because of algorithms that were behaving badly in the criminal justice system and uh, realizing that uh, someone really needed to ensure that criminal justice uh, became the conscience of artificial intelligence. And uh, that uh, entire mission actually brought me to the space that I am now, which is data activism. And I always say that I am the conscience of the data scientist. So my work really tries to ensure that there is a requisite measures of accountability and transparency and an ethical approach to algorithmic design and deployment, the deployment of AI systems. And it really tries to ensure that communities of color are made aware of being deployed and to understand that communities of color are need not only to be aware, but to be educated about the technology and to be educated about how the technology at this moment is being weaponized against black indigenous people of color. So uh, this opportunity at, as a, a scholar, a bundle scholar, and having access to the, the kinds of resources, uh, particularly for me, uh, the research potential that I have uh, through uh, Columbia University has provided me an extraordinary platform to stand on. And uh, although my project is taking three years, I've uh, probably achieved several of those milestones already. Um, I've uh, participated uh, in particular with a group of AI scholars and we've created uh, a fantastic uh, ethical uh, course that's uh, already on uh, Coursera. And uh, the book is in gear and the research has started and I have been uh, spending an extraordinary amount of time uh, speaking about my research so far and really changing minds already with this uh, research and, and really impacting the ways in which we think about data and understanding uh, that data in itself is not neutral, nor is uh, science uh, as objective as we think <laughs> it is, but bringing a perspective that understands the history of data collection or uh, the history of data classification and the extraordinary amount of intergenerational trauma that's transmitted in data. And that's something we don't think about, but that's also something that has an extraordinary amount of impact on communities of color when we think about education, when we think about healthcare, when we think about criminal justice. So I'll speak a little more when we have our panel discussion, but it's an extraordinary opportunity. I was referred to the program by another uh, scholar who's in an earlier cohort than myself, Peter Noel, and Peter and I are both natives of Trinidad and Tobago. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and I look forward to sharing much more. Right on. Thank you, Renee. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's some pretty deep stuff. Um, Debbie? Thank you, Flores. Thank you, Renee, karaoke. It's great to be here with you all. Uh, Diana, thank you for helping me with the slides. First, I want to ask the audience, has it ever crossed your mind that when you drop your kid off at school, they would not be taught to read? That just did not occur to me. My son was not taught to read in public school. And I've learned since this is not uncommon in public or private schools. As I was struggling with my son's situation, I was affiliated with a reentry organization. 
And my friend Vivian Nixon, who leads the organization, was in the first cohort of the community scholars. At her community lecture, she talked about she talk, spoke about the lack of bootstraps and boots in our society and how that common metaphor is inappropriate. Literacy should be an important part of that metaphorical bootstrap and literacy is sorely missing. Like too many, my son did not get his bootstrap in elementary school. He was still basically illiterate in fourth grade with poor self-esteem and anxiety about school developing into mental health issues. He has dyslexia, a neurobiological learning difference that requires explicit instruction on decoding words with phonics to learn how to read and spell. His school did not offer that. Those who are not taught to read, even those who are highly intelligent, often disconnect from school. After finding a new specialized school for my son, I wanted to understand why the public school could not help him and so many others. Seeing the statistics, I became concerned and applied to the Community Scholars Program. Since I've gained a new community, um, the access to classes, faculty, and research has helped me sharpen my thinking. And I have a certain gravitas in the greater community that has helped me reach a bigger audience. And you know, I'm not even on TikTok as my son teases me. Um, tonight, I'm gonna to talk about the literacy crisis and its ramifications or what I like to call symptoms. I'm gonna talk about the causes and finally my solution. It isn't far-fetched and there will be a huge return on investment. So as campaigns and programming to end mass incarceration strengthen, the literacy crisis continues. 50% of the prison population is functionally illiterate due to dyslexia and poor instruction. That's three times higher than the general population. And many more prisoners are illiterate due mostly to poor instruction. Only 34% of eighth graders read at eighth grade level and that is expected to drop further because of COVID. The head of economist at Gallup says adult illiteracy costs our nation $2.2 trillion annually, trillion. Um, a new white paper by the Boston Consulting Group says that dyslexia and its consequences will cost California $12 billion this year. That actually doesn't surprise me. The New York City taxpayers spent about a quarter million dollars for my son to catch up to his potential. The poor instruction in our school leaves people unprepared for college or careers. In 2020, many of these people became known as frontline workers in jobs where education wasn't a prerequisite and the work had a pay scale to match. The pay scale forces workers to live in extended family households. The coronavirus spread quickly through their communities. Of course, we're always going to need frontline workers, but perhaps those could be transitional jobs rather than lifelong careers. Under and illiterate people are also effectively disenfranchised. Ballot measures are written at college level and organized in ballots in columns, more like an Asian language with two below one and three to the right of one. Literacy is clearly linked to health, career access and economic success, civic participation, as well as social, emotional and mental health outcomes. It is linked to how we spend our tax dollars. For instance, it takes four times longer to remediate a fourth grade student as it does to teach a first grader. And it is more costly as students age. There are more costs to our social safety nets as you might imagine. The literacy crisis is a public health crisis. If we want to look at causes, next slide, rather than symptoms, we can look at the history of reading instruction. The reading wars have taken educators on a roller coaster for almost a century. Significant evidence exists for explicit literacy instruction, including synthetic phonics but teacher preparation programs remain unswayed. Whether the earth is round or flat, whether climate change is real or how to teach reading are all arguments between people who believe in science and those who do not. The literacy crisis affects all students equally but does not affect them equitably. Unproven reading approaches and even good instruction delivered poorly are pervasive in our schools while the instructional approaches developed by neuroscientists and psychologists are available only to students with a lot of resources for tutors or specialized schools. Unprepared, teachers often just wing it when they arrive in a classroom or training for teachers gets watered down when other teachers support them. Neither K to three or special education teachers are licensed by an ability to teach reading. Next slide. 
The way students learn to read is not related to intelligence, nor is it natural like speech. The broad instruction in our schools um, just reaches about 40% of readers. To reach proficiency, 60% of readers need explicit diagnostic reading instruction. A subset of these students has dyslexia and needs repeated explicit instruction. Dyslexia accounts for 80% of all learning disabilities. But currently, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act fails dyslexic kids because they are not assessed before third grade. Risk for dyslexia is detectable in pre-K. Still, universities leave teachers, doctors, and social workers unprepared to help struggling readers meet their potential in school and life. Information about teaching reading tends to be valued by neuroscientists and some psychologists and a few professors of education with no coordinated effort to bring best practices to the field. Families with resources can compensate for poor instruction with tutoring and enrichment. Their children will always find a pathway to higher education and a career. But for low-income students who do not learn to read, high school dropout rates are very high, leaving them with limited options. Young children of color are often lay diagnosed with behavioral issues when they are simply frustrated with reading. The frustration is often penalized and criminalized rather than addressed with instruction. Have you ever met a mother frustrated because teachers called her kid lazy? Literacy advocates call this dystichia or suggest there are teaching disabilities rather than learning disabilities. Around the country, there are new policies and laws for reading um, instruction and dyslexic students, but New York is way behind this already too slow band bandwagon. Here's my solution. We need to attack this crisis systemically rather than transactionally. And on behalf of all struggling readers, not just those diagnosed with dyslexia, the dyslexic students are the canaries in the coal mine. My proposed organization is called the Literacy Leadership Center for Social Justice. And it would be a university-based center supporting literacy experts from many fields in promoting proven reading instruction methods. The center would build relationships across university schools and departments to take on the literacy crisis. The bulk of the responsibility, of course, lies with teaching colleges. However, doctors and social workers also have a role to help families with children at risk of reading challenges by recommending early intervention and helping parents understand how to advocate at school. University-based economists could be doing more research on the cost and other ramifications of poor literacy instruction. Others in business schools could help with organizational change practices. It's going to be hard to tell teachers they've been doing something ineffectively for 20 or more years. The center would try to change the trajectory of struggling readers through events, research, advocacy, and thoughtful change management. The organization would bring everybody to the same table to address the crisis together. The BCG paper I referred to earlier says that early screening for risk of reading disabilities and teacher training would provide at least an 800% return on investment. Is there something better to invest in? It's time to treat the causes rather than the symptoms of the literacy crisis. 20 years after the National Reading Panel recommended schools return to evidence-based approaches, the popular Teachers College Reading and Writing Project recently took some baby steps in this direction but we can't depend on taxpayer dollars and postgraduate professional development like TC offers. It needs to begin with pre-service education. I want to build the Literacy Leadership Center for Social Justice here using the pull of the Tamer Center to influence other university schools and departments. Here in District 5, Central Harlem, near one of the nation's best universities, 71% of third graders are not reading proficiently. In District 6, further uptown, just a little better, 69%. In District 3, the Upper West Side matches District 6. And District 2 on the Upper East Side is only a little better in third grade. The difference is the families in those wealthier districts can afford help. So you can see the bigger differences in eighth grade. But still, there are simply too many eighth graders that don't know the combination of P and H makes the F sound, or that protest is a root word of Protestant. Literacy should lead the equity agenda. I argue it is the social justice issue. If we don't teach people how to read, how do we expect to fix <clears throat> other social ills? 
please join me in this fight and help create the Literacy Leadership Center for Social Justice. All right, thank you, Debbie. Yeah. Well, I guess we're gonna have a pretty good conversation once we get started. You know, um, uh, Vivian, you're next. Thank you so much. Flores and the Columbia team for organizing this event. And thank you, Debbie Karaoke and Renee for the important work that you're doing. I am Vivian Williams Kurtz, founder and executive director of Harlem Wellness Center. Harlem Wellness Center is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to educate, motivate and support lifelong healthy living practices in Harlem and beyond. Um, we are addressing health disparity and driving solutions by infusing mindfulness-based practices in the process of change making in five areas, racial justice for health justice, elder health, aging well, African-American women in health, power of nature, eco-consciousness program, and healthy behaviors wellness program. Considering the double pandemic, of COVID and racial justice and the civil rights movement, our work is really at the center of a lot of what's happening right now. As an Anelia Bundles community scholar, my project is aimed at forging an institutional and community partnership that nurtures a positive relations between the university and its Harlem neighborhood. I'm approaching this project on a personal, community, and global level. On the personal level, I have audited 10 courses in the Columbia Business and Nonprofit Management programs through the Alilia Bundles Scholars Program. These courses have allowed me to grow professionally in my executive and leadership skills. On a community level, I've collaborated with a variety of Columbia University schools, affiliate institutions, and student organizations that include the Columbia Wellness Center, the Department of Counseling and Clinical Psychology, the Hub for Food Education and Policy at TC, the Columbia Chapter of Nourish International, CEPL Students of Color, Tompkins Hall Child Care and Nursery School, the Forum, and the Wallet Gallery. The projects that I have collaborated on have involved research, data collection and analysis, nutrition education, panel participation, mindfulness and yoga sessions, lectures, and virtual wellness workshops. There's currently a collaboration between Columbia Wellness Center and Harlem Wellness Center happening at this moment, and that is the virtual wellness workshops every Monday and Thursday through November. And you can tune in for more information on how to join those virtual sessions. On a global level, we're involved in awareness building and health promotion that's relating especially to black women's maternal health and health equity. We're looking to deepen our work on a global level through initiatives that move the work we're doing on a community level already towards collaborations with academic, public and private groups that expand funding, research and broad support <clears throat> regarding health disparity. I came to this work through a personal experience of having my family repre that represents many African American families throughout the country, where heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and stroke are prevalent. My interest in holistic health and wellness as well as my passion for community centers have been merged to create a hybrid where we provide holistic health and wellness opportunities for people to come and experience 
activities that manage um, blood pressure, that help people eat um, healthy meals and um, that allow people to build community around wellness. We know that when you're going against the grain and against the tide, it's harder. So it's really important that we build a health conscious community and a movement, one person, one block and one community at a time. Our invitation to the Tamer students and the Columbia community is for your involvement in strengthening our relationship and utilizing the resources for the mutual benefit of the institution, our organization, and the Harlem community at large. We're currently recruiting roll up your sleeve board members and volunteers to serve as junior and senior board members. We're looking for <laughs> to provide emphasis in the areas of business development, finances, marketing and PR, corporate partnerships, local government partnerships and grant writing and fundraising. This has already proven over the last three years to be a very mutually beneficial partnership. And it's an honor to um, be able to do this work together and I thank you and I welcome you. Right on. Thank you, uh, Vivian. And, th and thank you to um, you know, all of the, um, the scholars who are presenters. Um, you know, one of the things that I see the, the Bundle Scholars Program is, is, you know, is finding the next big idea in the community, uh, in the community of Harlem. So, um, and, and, you know, and that's what universities do. Universities are always looking for the next big idea. So, uh, this is for all of you to, uh, to talk about, um, how would you see taking your, your new big idea and institutionalizing it, say at an institution like Columbia University? Anybody can, can answer that, please. I can talk well, to that. Okay. Go ahead, karaoke. All right. Um, well, as far as institutionalizing it, um, the medium that I'm using or the media that I'm using for the Harlem Maker Fair is really already institutionalized. Um, what can I bring to it that's new? Um, and that is around the ownership of people in the community actually owning the Harlem Maker Fair. So um, that goes to the model. The model of the Harlem Maker Fair looks like parents or other caregivers being given a nominal stipend to participate and help youth to build projects over several weeks that they will then exhibit at the Harlem Maker Fair. With the, um, at, at a place like Columbia University, the Harlem Maker Fair is a kind of trade school unto itself. So it's basically injecting the spirit of trade and, and making um, back into the conversation of education. Anybody else? Hi. Hi. Um, since my <laughs> idea is really about making sure the professionals have training before they go out into the field. I think it's perfect for a university. I think it would be easier to happen centered at a university rather than being a program knocking on the door of all these, of the university. But I think to make a real difference, it would be a model for other universities and other cities. And it could change things, you know, exponentially around the country. And I see, um, I have a vision for a really deep partnership with the Mailman School of Public Health and um, a possible incubation um, process where there is um, a, a line between the students, a pathway from the students to the Harlem community working through Harlem Wellness Center and not only just um, working but building together and expanding the vision. Uh, 
Um, Let me just jump in and say, uh, at the moment, I'm working on a, on a product, a, a solution, a technological solution that really makes the uh, re-entry process or the re-socialization process of, of returning uh, citizens uh, much easier. And it really uh, fuses uh, virtual reality and, and, and gaming uh, in a sort of correctional space. So uh, it's uh, being developed, and it's being developed in partnership with uh, another organization, but it's something that definitely uh, could uh, become part of that reprogram, uh, not only uh, teaching uh, data science or teaching coding to uh, individuals who are returning to the community, but actually using this to uh, reshape the thinking before uh, we uh, before we entry. So there, there's much uh, partnership and institutionalization as you, you put it, certainly. Okay, thank you, Renee. I mean, this is obviously a, a marketing platform, a way to talk about the ideas that you have. So could, can you individually tell me about how, um, how you plan on marketing, what it is you're doing? Well, I can jump in, uh, certainly, but the marketing uh, is really, I'm really in the design phase right now. Uh, you may know that I have a, a long history of myself in, in communications. I began my career as a journalist and I worked extensively in media also as a broadcaster. So there is a marketing strategy it's in the de design phase right now. But I think because this tool really represents taking therapeutic jurisprudence to uh, a virtual reality experience, it definitely is something I've already found interest uh, by some of the tech companies uh, who, who find the, the, the idea to be quite novel. It really is how do I, uh, you know, once it is created, it will definitely be marketed within corrections, within uh, psychotherapy, within uh, vocational rehab as a tool for practitioners who are part of that criminal justice system to use. So the marketing strategy is there uh, combined with the product, but it's now to get the resources to build and to deploy and to, to really get, uh, get the product out. Okay, great. great. I can um, add to that. Yes. In addition to the Mailman School of Public Health, obviously there are, there are other creative ways to collaborate as well. And I also see um, you know, business development and consultancy as a different way that we can work together through the business school and the Tamer School um, Institute of Social, um, yeah. So that's another way of, um, having that type of insight and creativity and think tanking um, with people who are in this field would be really valuable. And I think it would be very exciting to explore with a larger team, the possibilities. Yeah, my idea is to reach out to um, folks who can help with grant writing and acquiring grants so that they can actually um, help pay for um, families to then take my computer science classes. Um, anyone can actually purchase the computer science classes for even a school, a school group. And then um, I partner with uh, someone like Teals or DYCD or um, ha uh, Harlem Commonwealth Council um, to help me identify a school that they think would be a great partner for pairing with Latimer Heights and the Harlem Maker Fair for my products and services. So, um, and my background is in education. I've been a, a teacher for over 20 years, um, both a museum educator as well as a high school teacher here in New York. So that's kind of my, my field and my, my, my area of expertise is working with schools, working with community-based organizations. And I um, have plenty of friends within a dyslexia echo chamber and I'm really trying to get out of that. And I do that with working with um, criminal justice and reentry organizations um, and looking at some of the other literacy organizations that aren't seeing the results, you know, the book, the people ending book deserts um, and distributing books. But when they distribute the books and the kids can't read them, it doesn't help. 
So I'm really trying to pull together a lot of literacy people that aren't quite um, connected to the literacy instruction. Well, that's great, um, Debbie. Um, I just wanted to add that in addition to doing um, you know, computer classes online, everything's virtual right now. Another thing is that I've seen that has been successful with my model is actually um, purchasing or getting uh, some partners to purchase hardware such as microcontrollers or, or like small computers that then um, I can distribute to families to keep um, if they have a device or, or some tangible uh, piece of equipment that they can own. Uh, they're more likely to go home and tinker with this stuff. And also uh, the reason that I have um, an aim towards families is because the kid has a lot going on throughout the, the entire day. You know, uh, when I was a teacher, I had a kid maybe for 45 minutes, but what, what are the other influences going on around the house, right? Um, I know for me as a kid, I was more likely to stay in STEM uh, projects um, and keep that interest up if I had either a group of friends like that or adults around me, someone at home who, can, um, who was gonna explore that with me. They don't have to be an expert. They don't have to know anything about it. They just have to be willing to work toward that, uh, to learn. And I actually did a project like this with Face Lab, um, which is a, a, a one of the divisions of the Department of Education where I wrote for the EB3 robotics curriculum. And we actually were able to acquire kits for parents um, and schools to take home. And um, we were able to pay them um, a little bit of money as well after they got through it. So I think incentivizing and also personalizing the education experience by, um, you know, when you read to your child, <laughs> you know, um, your child is more likely to read, um, basically reading together, personalizing the, the overall experience. So that is, that is, that is my approach, which is, um, um, I've done it before and it has been successful. So I'm looking to get assistance in, you know, grant writing and acquiring funding that's going to allow me to distribute hardware to families and also set them up with some classes so that they can produce the Maker Faire. Success for the Maker Faire for me looks like families in Harlem own the Maker Faire. Okay, yeah, thank you, karaoke. Um, I, I know all of you have, you have goals. Um, you know, there are milestones that you wanna meet with your projects and that sort of thing. So, you know, besides say, you know, obviously embedding it in an institution, uh, getting it fully funded, uh, talk to me about um, how you measure success. Is it a, you know, an individual feeling or is it about uh, obviously, you know, with, with Debbie, you know, you, you want to, you know, teach people how to read, you know, create more literacy. So could all of you kind of talk about how you see uh, yourselves measuring success with regards to your project? I think it has, it has changed for me, definitely, especially when we think about the climate that we're in right now. Um, really success for um, the Harlem Make the Harlem Maker Fair started in 2018, and we had our first virtual one this past summer. Um, success actually is keeping this going. That's what success looks like for the Harlem Maker Fair. That it that it shows itself up, um, you know, at least twice a year. Um, if we can keep that going and actually having um, because the reason I started the Maker Fair was because Harlem didn't have a Maker Fair. And being a person who worked who worked in the maker community, I used to work at the New York Hall of Science where they had the big maker fair. Um, but a cultural oasis like Harlem didn't have a maker fair, or at least not a pronounced one where someone was saying, this is going to be the Harlem maker fair. So um, just actually establishing that and having Harlem also be known for um, taking um, the, all the creativity and expressing that through 21st century skill sets. Um, that is what success looks like for me right now. <laughs> that might change. Okay, great. <laughs> well, 
Well, I'll say for me, it's, it's about diversity and equity and inclusion. And, and that's the platform on which I stand at the moment. Much of my work when it comes to artificial intelligence and it comes to, to tech is about empowering communities and ensuring that communities are not further marginalized or, or alienated because of the ways in which algorithms and data are being deployed against a black indigenous people of color. So for me, it's about inclusion. For me, it's about diversity. It's about bringing that kind of awareness and understanding and education to communities, particularly in upper Manhattan and giving them that ability to participate in the design and deployment of, of this project. And, and that's the challenge for me. How do I get the community involved? Because I mean, much of my work is about stakeholder engagement in tech and it's really bringing this project to the community getting the community involved and really assisting in building more resilience in the community. And for me, success is measured just by understanding and having that understanding that with technology, not only could I transform a life, but I can also empower an individual to transform someone else's life. So, so that's how success looks for me. I know. Thank you. Well, we had a team of students from Columbia that did a wonderful research project and we were looking at how do we inspire and motivate um, a population that may not be currently motivated to change and adapt to healthy behaviors um, to actually do so. And we received an analysis of the data and a report. And so building on that, um, one of the things that we want to do is we want to continue to implement these different ideas that we think that will actually help increase that participation and, um, and activities that mitigate stress. Um, we know that stress is one of the major factors that impacts health and wellness. And so um, when you add that component into, in with um, the stressors of systemic racism and social determinants of health on individuals um, that may be in the Harlem community and light communities, you have a recipe for, um, you know, a lot of unnecessary diseases and health implications. So now that we have some baseline data um, we can look at um, how, what types of activities that we're doing that is actually inspiring behavioral change. And I would say that, you know, our, our goal and our outcomes are to have people actually changing um, behavior um, to deal with stress to adaptive behaviors, things that are, um, supporting their wellness that include you know nature and meditation and exercises and eating healthy foods as opposed to some of the go-to um, maladaptive behaviors that may be more commonplace um, we would measure success yeah. we can we're looking to normalize um, wellness and to create a sense of belonging in this billion, and I've heard it even said as a trillion dollar industry, which a lot of people do not have a sense of belonging in um, due to a myriad of factors. And we're just one at a time working to strip down those barriers that prevent um, our target population, which is people who are most vulnerable to adult onset diseases that are preventable because of lifestyle and social determinants of health. I know. Thank you, Vivi. Um, thank you, Debbie. Thanks. Um, you said it. The people start to read. Um, we have baseline data on reading scores. Um, but I really think success would be measured by college and career access. Our, is teaching them to read and giving them all these skills actually moving them up the economic ladder would be a better measure of success. Okay. And I think literacy will. 
Okay, no, that's great. That's great. I, I, I see we have uh, quite a few questions, and I believe uh, Diana, are you going to? Uh, yes. Start reading a couple of them. Yeah. So there's a question in here on if the scholars can elaborate on how the impact that is being part of Columbia community, how it's had an effect on your project being involved with Columbia. Yeah. And I guess uh, a follow up question to that, which kind of provides more clarity is um, how does being locally centered near Columbia also help in terms of resources and networks and um, how does it help support your project's trajectory and goals and development? Well, yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Vivian. Well, being local um, makes it really accessible for partnership with um, students um, involved in the university and, um, and for resource sharing. So that's the first and simplest way. And I think I've shared, but I'll just reiterate for me, the personal and professional development through the courses that I've been able to take has been um, invaluable as well as the partnerships have been really rich and a mutually beneficial. So that's how this program has impacted our program. I'll say, I mean, there are several ways here uh, for me that um, this community scholars program has um, helped to enrich the uh, experience of building the Harlem Maker Fair. First and foremost is relationships, just meeting um, all the other scholars um, and meeting ones that came before this cohort and being inspired by so many different projects and just knowing that so many people are doing some amazing work. Um, so that's first and foremost, hopefully I've you know, created some relationships that can last for some time. Um, uh, it has helped me educationally. I've taken classes, computer science classes ever since I started, so at least like two per semester. Um, and that's great for me as a person who has a background in education because I get to see um, how uh, computer science information is distributed, um, what kind of formats um, a curriculum can be put in, what, are, what tools are being used, how can I take the information I'm getting from the classes and then kind of um, wrap that around projects that I'm creating and make them uh, simple enough so that someone who hasn't stepped foot on the campus can actually um, access, can create something cool with that with that new knowledge. Uh, the affiliation itself, you know, I have a Columbia email. So um, when you when you send an email, people associate you with the institution that they hold in high regards. Like they have to be just transparent about that. Um, workshops. I've been when we were able to do things in person. I was able to hold um, several robotics uh, programming workshops um, on, on the campus and then events, events like this, because um, they broadcast my project into deeper channels of the community. Yeah, I have um, been able to take some great classes as well. I got to take the history of English and I can talk better about um, how kids struggle to read I've taken classes at TC um, to kind of learn what they're teaching teachers. I've, um, yeah, it's been pretty amazing. Um, I've taken some psychology classes and then um, right now I'm in the, a class on US intellectual history, trying to figure out if the intellectuals along the way, along the way have had an influence on reading instruction. So, and then the nonprofit management classes, even though I've got a whole career of nonprofit management behind me, um, looking at it from an academic point of view is an interesting way to think about it as well. So um, all these have been helping me. Well, for me, this is just my second year here. And of course, COVID happened and 
and things had to change. So the uh, relationship that I was hoping to have with the university this year is not the relationship that I'm going to have. But I think for me so far, I've been really motivated and inspired to do so much more. And I will think my conversations with Flores continue to inspire me because I think uh, he really is a, is a pillar of motivation and uh, sharing his own life story has really uh, generated uh, an extra energy in me to get my project going and to get this project deployed. So. I think just the creatives around us, and I think uh, the kind of leadership uh, that we are experiencing at this moment uh, really is, is taking each one of us a step further. Mm. Oh, yes, I'm going to piggyback on that, Renee, because I um, am so grateful to faculty and um, you know professors that have been so supportive and um, and nurturing through the throughout my time here. So I definitely feel like I have some champions and um, I have mentors um, and that's invaluable as well. And so there's another question in here about the Columbia University Network and plugging into some of the opportunities to co-create and brainstorm ideas across campus. Some of the examples that were given are the design studio and the design thinking uh, workshops that they run and then something similar to, at the Tamer Center at the business school around Spark workshops. And um, I know also the engineering school. Have you guys looked into some of those workshops? Well, I've looked into many of those. Of course, I didn't get the opportunity to get involved in any of them uh, just yet. Uh, they're definitely all on my uh, agenda to do. And as soon as I, I experience it, I will definitely check back and, and give you an update. But as I said, uh, this is my second year in uh, the program. And of course, uh, much has happened since I entered. And of course, it's, you know, it's taking some sort of restructuring and repositioning on my own part. But definitely those are things that I had on my uh, agenda for this year. Yeah, I, um, I was able to actually meet some folks from the engineering school through, through um, another student um, and through George as well, um, who works at the, uh, the school of professional studies. So that we, we actually formed a collective um, that is NYC Makerspace. Um, and we have a website as well. And it's myself and about nine other uh, Columbia students who were working at the rec center in Marcus Garvey Park, actually, um, because we knew not everybody can come up to the campus and be in the building and be in the school taking classes. And we were given some space. Um, and it was also a way to give people an opportunity to learn things like um, 3D printing, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, computer science classes and not have to actually be on the Columbia campus, um, but working with uh, students from Columbia. And actually a lot of them have helped to put together the Harlem Maker Fair and um, did exhibit projects and facilitate at the Harlem Maker Fair as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I see that there's a lot of great um, opportunities through the design studio. I was able to take one workshop and I keep an eye out for other ones, but that was a, a good start. And I'm like Renee, Renee, they're all on my list and I hopefully we'll get to them. <laughs> Renee, this question is actually for you. And the question's around, are you building or planning to build anything around re-entry with your data? Thank you for that question. Yes, of course. Uh, the uh, data is looking at how do we uh, re-think uh, re-entry because I've worked in re-entry for about 15 years. As I said, my specialization is therapeutic jurisprudence. I entered working in substance abuse, and now I work, uh, of course, uh, looking at how we can uh, redesign the approaches that we are using to reduce something like recidivism. So uh, for me, it's combining uh, voice technology and virtual reality technology to design uh, a solution that can be deployed across the criminal justice system to really engage uh, 
the corrections uh, process a little more dynamically and a little more real life and to bring more of a humanistic approach to the ways in which we uh, deal with corrections, in particular vocational rehabilitation. So definitely the uh, data is going to be infused in a solution that is supposed to deliver, uh, for me, I hope, extraordinary uh, change. And then Debbie, this next question is for you. Can you share a little more about what NYC and specifically the surrounding neighborhood uh, is currently currently offers to students with dyslexia. Wow, um, it's not good news. Um, we have a wait to fail system. Uh, kids don't get screened and given the right instruction. They are, um, are it's called return to or response to intervention. And they really have to fail to get really good help. But even then, you have to have a parent advocate who really understands that um, the school is not teaching them to read and um, can then hire a lawyer in the for-profit world or go to Advocates for Children or another nonprofit lawyer to help you get resources outside the school system, whether that's um, a tutor or a specialized school. Worst news there is there's only about 2,000 seats for probably 170,000 students that need them in the specialized school. And there's more tutors that can help as well. The DOE started a program not too long ago where they trained um, teachers in the, what's called the science of reading and they, they turned them into literacy coaches and they put them into the most struggling schools to start with. And so you had to be K to second grade in a struggling school with a teacher that recognized that you were struggling and wanted help teaching you. Um, so all those things were still kind of batting against you. So if you were a struggling reader in a decent school, there was no help for you. If you were a struggling reader um, older than second grade, there was no help for you. Um, UFT has trained about a thousand um, uh, special ed teachers as well but in 1800 schools, a thousand teachers isn't making a whole lot of difference. So, you know, we really have to look at this in a much more systemic way, not these little small piecemeal approaches. Then as a follow-up to that, Debbie, do you see any connection between the data and the relationship between reading and health? Oh, absolutely. Um, and there's a lot of papers written on this, but um, to be able to really advocate for yourself, you have to be able to read, you have to have a good vocabulary, you have to be able to relate to your doctor. Um, the, um, you know, abilities, and then, you know, just like the COVID example, if um, you don't have a good job, or um, even if your parents are working two jobs each to be able to earn enough money because they don't have the education to have one job only, then the kids are at home and they're probably not eating as well. And so they're having health issues or there's just not enough money to buy healthy food or they think because you know healthy food in the long, to in the long term is cheaper, but in the short term is not. Um, so there's, you know, there's all sorts of correlations between literacy and health. And a lot of it has to do with career access, but a lot of it has to do with just your ability to communicate your health needs. And this question is for everyone. Um, given the current pandemic, have you guys seen your, are, have you seen or are your projects affected by the COVID-19 uh, crisis? And have you had to pivot? Well, I would say uh, definitely COVID has impacted uh, every one of us and it has impacted the ways in which we are just doing things in general. So you've had to reposition for me, I've had to reposition, I've had to rethink uh, some of the things that I want to do in particular now that the world is going contactless and much of the projects may not be able to engage people uh, face to face and have that one-on-one -on -one experience. The good thing is the project that I'm working on is an AI uh, project. So uh, it's able to do that contactless interface and it's able to now include more people into the design, uh, more uh, from a stakeholder perspective in the design of the project. So I think if anything, COVID has made me a bit more creative and I'm grateful for that. Thank you. <laughs> I, 
I would say COVID is affecting struggling readers more because they're getting less instruction mm. and the, um, they're further away from their teachers. I've been pushing for something to, you know, it would take a lot of political will, but what if the struggling readers, if they're in remote learning, just got access to the teachers that knew how to teach them, despite what brick and mortar school they went to, you know, if they're getting remote instruction, they should be able to get it from someone that's appropriately trained to teach them. Um, but that's going to take a lot of political will to instruct someone not in their uh, zone school and um, district school. For me personally, I've got a lot more time on my hands. I um, sadly lost my job, but I'm taking more classes. I have no transportation to get to the classes, so I decided I could take more. Um, I'm invited to speak at a lot more places around the country because there's no flight for people to, to um, have to go on. So that's been really good. But, you know, I really think the reading scores for these current first, second, and third graders are going to go down because of their instruction right now. Well, on the bright side, I will say that for the past few years, I have been attempting to engage our community in online interaction, and I've not been successful. We're definitely, um, the Harlem Wallace Center community is very tactile, very in-person um, type of community. And so this situation has um, helped people to break through the barriers to engaging through technology, which is wonderful because it's something that we can carry over when the weather is poor, when um, someone is having issues with childcare, um, that they'll still be able to engage in classes because um, when we are able to connect again in person, um, we will continue to stream live so that people will have access to the classes. And um, when we do, uh, I, I am anticipating that considering that our population is um, very, um, high risk that will probably be the very end of the last phase of opening. Um, I personally have lost four people close to me in the Harlem community through COVID. Um, a church that is on the corner of where we have our program. Um, at last count, I was my understanding, it lost 15 members. So unlike some of the communities around the country where it seems like there is no pandemic and that people are able to say that they don't know somebody who's had COVID, um, it's a very big part of my world as it relates to um, the Harlem community. So I, um, I'm happy that we've been able to pivot and to be able to engage with um, not just the Harlem community, but through with um, um, multiple boroughs. Um, and we've been able to reach all five boroughs um, through programming where people also need the services that we provide. Yeah, and so for me, it's been, there is pros and cons to it. Some of the cons is I'm used to also working with an intergenerational uh, group at times when I'm instructing. And um, it's really easy to give instruction to a younger person, let's say, a junior high school kid or a high school kid because they're kind of born into technology. But some of the other folks that I would work with are, are much older and not as savvy. So they might not even join the Zoom or the WebEx meeting um, because they're afraid that they're just gonna have technical issues with the hardware in itself. So um, the other downside is, um, for example, this past summer, I usually would do a summer program and of course that was canceled, <laughs> you know? So, so, th so those are a couple of cons to it. Um, 
creatively, I'm a better teacher now. Um, I come up with a lot of projects that are around biometrics about how to stay fit while you're while we're in quarantine, for example. And um, I had planned to use this time, you know, it's a lot of uncertainty. So you learn how to, um, you know, don't make your Zoom calls too long, you know. Um, you you got to really think about the threshold and the amount of events that are pulling at another person's attention before you plan a 90-minute Zoom session or WebEx session. So um, creatively, it has pushed me. I think I'm a better um, creative uh, instructor. Um, but again, those things like the summer programs, for example, or working or working with an elderly population, that that has kind of dropped off. And Debbie, a follow up question about Columbia's role in supporting your projects. Have you learned anything from the Teachers College around the interest in dys the dyslexic community? And uh, uh, we know they support the reading and writing project, but will you commit to the science of reading or will they commit to the science of reading? Yeah, so last year they started working with um, a neuropsych center called the Child Mind Institute and started Lucy Calkins, who runs that center, um, runs the Teachers College Center, um, started learning about dyslexia. Um, I would say she's taken a couple baby steps um, towards the science of reading. Um, they are working on how they can actually fit it into their workshop framework. Um, and that's kind of their challenge right now. Um, they have actually decided that some of the methods they've been promoting don't work for many struggling readers and have backed off the, of them, um, but still haven't really um, gone all the way to what um, the schools like the Windward School or the Stephen Gaynor School or the other schools that teach kids how to read do. Mm -hmm. And have you guys noticed any challenges when you're trying to tap into the connections across Columbia's university? I found our um, point people at the in the Office of Government Affairs um, to be extremely helpful in um, creating. Uh, um, opportunities and connections and support. And I found um, on several occasions where professors that I um, requested auditing permission from had no idea what the um, scholars program was and they would reach out and they would um, get an explanation from the staff, which um, was weighted and, you know, it, created um, access. Um, yeah, so definitely. And have you guys explored maybe creating any opportunities for cross school formal teams of students to work on projects uh, for you guys? I haven't explored it, but I would really like it. Well, I was going to say it's definitely something that I've been thinking about and, and definitely something that I was going to approach uh, the team about because I think it's critical because as I said prior, you know, I'm really into stakeholder engagement and community engagement and not only the students, but the uh, community around the university and how could we partner the students and the community and of course uh, the scholars in developing our projects just to ensure the weight of it is, is really uh, community built. And uh, you know, I think it's, it's so critical. Yeah. And what lessons learned are you all pulling from each other's successes and elsewhere and applying to the scope of your own work? Well, I've been oh. curious about um, how um, the role that literacy um, plays in, in terms of programming and thinking about the project that Debbie has also, um, 
So I invited her actually to be um, a keynote speaker for the Harlem Maker Fair this past summer. So um, I'm looking at ways to create authentic connections across both of our projects. I actually presented at the Maker's Fair. <laughs> yes, you did. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, you did, Vivian. Thank you. Yep. Great, and maybe I'll end with this last question uh, and see if any of you have questions for each other that the audience might have missed that you think uh, we should know about your projects or ones that you might be curious about each other's projects. Well, actually, um, I'm about to reach out to Renee because, um, if I get this consultancy with a reentry organization because I'm looking for some guest speakers to come in. And mostly it's going to be about literacy, but because it's a reentry organization and the the people in it have been away from technology for so long. I thought Renee was going to be, would be on my list um, just to help bridge that gap for everybody. Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> well, I, I do see that time is, um, is, is winding down. You know, I really want to, uh, to thank everybody, I mean, you know, for um, for your great presentations and for the uh, the great work you're doing and for and for making us look good, you know, and um, you know, I think that this is a a great opportunity for the uh, the Columbia community and other people who have tuned in to uh, find out about all of the uh, the interesting work that we are doing at. Um, Columbia University. And so if, if, if people want to follow up, uh, I, obviously you can follow up with the Tamer Center and they will uh, connect us with uh, whatever information there is so that we can uh, make sure that um, all of the, um, the scholars are um, plugged in. So I, I think that at this time, I think I'll, I'll turn it back over to uh, Sandra Navali to uh, kind of wrap things up. Terrific. Thank you, Flores. And thank you, Renee, Karaoke, Debbie, Vivian. Um, just from a personal level, I learned so much about what you all are doing. My head is buzzing because I've got a lot of things to follow up with each of you about. Um, there's so many things that are going on um, that we're seeing at the Tamer Center. And we'd love to figure out better ways of making those connections. So I've definitely got a whole bunch of emails to send after this. But Flores, thank you so much. You know, I think um, the Bundles Community Scholars Program and your office are really such a terrific resource in um, helping us think through, you know, people and change makers who are in the surrounding community for Columbia University. And, you know, part of this, the role of a center at a, at a university like Columbia is to um, breathe in, you know, what is all the um, amazing work that's happening in the local community and then breathe out like ideas and research projects and student engagement. And so the more that we can have these types of events to connect um, the alumni and students and faculty and researchers and to really just give exposure to all the terrific work um, that Renee, Karaoke, Debbie, Vivian and all the other scholars are doing. Um, so my deepest Thanks and gratitude to all of you for spending the time with us um, and an open invitation to anyone who's on this call who has thoughts or um, resources to share or ideas and um, ways that we can make this forum better so that we can better help build the, that sort of connective tissue and leverage the resources of all of our collective networks to, you know, solving some of these social and environmental um, challenges that communities, our local communities face. So thank you all. Thank you for spending time with us this evening. And we look forward to seeing you at the next discussion. <laughs>